Welcome back. Time now for the France 24 debate. We're turning our eye to London, where the state's opening of Parliament has taken place this Wednesday. That's an event which the Queen usually reads out the government's to-do list for the year ahead. But this year, the circumstances are a little bit different. For starters, the monarch read out the government's plans for the next two years. That's because she'll make no speech next year, with the assumption being that the government's going to be too busy with Brexit. And this very issue of Brexit was central to the nine-minute-long speech. Well, another big difference from the typical state opening of Parliament as there were no gold carriages, horses or tiaras in sight. This year, the Queen delivered her speech in dress-down mode. That's something uh, not without precedent, but which has not happened in more than 40 years. Well, despite not wearing a crown and ermine robes, the Queen's choice of attire did draw plenty of interest, not least because some say that her hat looked a lot like the European flag. So, what signal was she sending? What was this event all about? And just what is the state of UK politics right now? Well, to talk through all of that, I'm joined now from London by Labour Party member and political commentator Nora Mulready. Thank you so much for joining us. Also Hi. from London, uh, author, pundit and director of the Freedom Association and the Better Off Out campaign, Rory Broomfield. I'm also joined by Mike Finn, a researcher in British politics at the University of Warwick. And from Brussels, I'm joined by Ryan Heath, uh, a senior p uh, correspondent at Politico uh, Europe. Thank you uh, to all of you uh, for joining us. Let me start by turning to you, Mike, at the University of Warwick. For those who don't know uh, the British political landscape so well, what should we read into the fact that this was a dress-down affair? Just tell us what the significance was. Uh, not a huge amount, in short. Um, the significance was primarily purely logistical. It was simply because of the fact that we've had a snap election. There was an overlap in timings between the scheduling of the, um, of the state opening of Parliament today and the Queen's birthday commemorations, the Tribune of the Call the other day. So it was practically impossible for them to do enough rehearsals to make it happen. On the other hand, it does purely coincidentally strike a more sombre note possibly around some of the events that have happened recently in the UK, but that was by accident rather than design. Let me turn to Ryan in Brussels, because, of course, uh, Brexit was a, a key feature of that nine-minute-long speech. Um, and just seen from the European capital. Uh, what did we learn today as far as the British government's Brexit strategy and position is? Not an awful lot. And I think there won't be a lot of reassurance in the Queen's words for people watching in Brussels. They're quite concerned that this is an unstable government. They're not sure where Theresa May's majority is going to come from. They're not sure if the people who turned up for talks on Monday will still be turning up in three or in six months' time. And of course, it was not a very fleshed out Queen's speech. There were eight bills related to Brexit out of the 27, but we didn't learn any more except that, you know, a little bit embarrassingly, perhaps, a lot of what is already happening at the moment will have to continue, whether that is putting a new name on agriculture subsidies, whether that is simply replacing EU laws and calling them UK laws with all of the same content. And just a, a very a superficial question uh, to you again, uh, Ryan. Uh, the Queen's choice of outfit, do you think she's sending a signal to uh, the rest of the European Union that actually, had she been consulted, should have said remain? I don't think that's the signal, but I think there was a very clear signal because she also was quite curt with Jeremy Corbyn today. So I think she was sending a we are not amused signal, which is that this government and its opposition probably need to be more organised, be putting more quality people forward and be putting national interests uh, more to the forefront rather than be descending into the, the partisanness that has characterised a lot of recent debate. Uh, Nora from the Labour Party, let me just turn to you, because, of course, uh, a, a lot of speculation uh, surrounding the question of just how much longer uh, the British Prime Minister Theresa May can, can hang on in there for. H how long would you give her? Oh, my gosh. I mean, it could be, given the state of British politics at the moment, it could be anything from days to possibly weeks to months. I mean, who knows if she'll go the full two years. I've, I really doubt it. I think a lot of people doubt it. She's kind of under siege at the moment. Um, so much has happened. The election was a complete disaster for the Tory party and for the country. Um, you know, we've had a lot of terrible tragedies in this country um, recently, and um, she hasn't handled them well at all. Um, and so, she, yeah, she's in a very, very fragile place.
at the moment. Uh, Rory, let me just ask you, uh, do you agree with that firstly? And secondly, uh, do you see anybody waiting in the wings, perhaps someone that would be a, a, a possible uh, successor for Theresa May? Well, in terms of the horrific attacks, I agree. Uh, over the past month or so, the UK has been affected by numerous uh, attacks which have been horrific and atrocious and have been needed to be dealt with and disrupted the basic message of the campaign. But in terms of those who are waiting in the wing, irrespective of whether Theresa May stays or whether she goes, the government has a clear message on Brexit and it's going forward with the plan. It's going to leave the European Union and it wants to leave the single market and uh, indeed the customs union and has set out its uh, relationship or its desired relationship in the Lancaster House speech. And that's certainly the plan, whoever heads up the government from the Conservative side. Uh, and just staying with you for a moment, I mean, just looking at the state of, of, of what looks from this side of the channel, like a, a country in a certain amount of disarray. And as you say, a lot of it uh, has been a, a series of tragedies as well. But the political uh, situation there uh, and the uncertainty surrounding it, I mean, it, it's, it's worse than at any time in recent memory, isn't it? Well, I, I don't know. It depends how long your, your memory is. Uh, but in terms of uh, the approach to the European Union, in terms of the approach to negotiations, David Davis met with Michel Barnier uh, just yesterday. They seem to get on very well, a very productive conversation. And I expect that uh, negotiations to, uh, well, not just improve, but continue in that proactive and conducive uh, well, uh, negotiation framework and very much a friendly atmosphere uh, for the next two years up until the deal is done. Uh, Mike, let me just turn back to you at the University of Warwick. Um, do you think perhaps Rory's being optimistic there, given... Uh, that you know, the whole point of the election was to give Theresa May a stronger uh, negotiating platform with uh, Europe, and and of course that gamble uh, has not paid off, and she's uh, going to be standing in front of them a much weaker uh, prime minister, isn't she, than she would have done had she not called the election? I do think that the character of Brexit as it happens, as it goes forward, is more ambiguous now than it was before the election. I think that's the first thing to stress, because, frankly, the Chancellor is still the Chancellor, and we didn't expect that. We didn't expect Philip Hammond to still be in his post. That kind of shows you how diminished Theresa May is vis-a-vis -vis her own party. And the Chancellor kind of represents forces within the Conservative Party who are not perhaps as gung-ho about um, sacrificing certain economic interests on the altar of a hard Brexit. So given that that's the case, and given the parliamentary arithmetic that now exists within the Commons, I don't think it's fair to say that we know exactly what the government's Brexit plan looks like, or we may have some stated ambitions, but they've been relegated to that now. And I don't think it is clear what Brexit will look like. Clearly, any legislation as well that goes through Parliament in, it will be subject to amendments and subject potentially to considerable amendments. And whilst that doesn't necessarily condition the negotiations themselves directly, it will impact on the domestic political culture of the situation. And Theresa May's weakened leadership inevitably moves her away from some of the rhetoric that she was using prior to the election. Yeah, just turning back to you, uh, Nora, the, uh, my, this, is, this is a quote from the, uh, the speech today. The minority government is going to be one that consults and listens. Is that uh, an implication, do you think, that had this election gone differently, they'd have been less consultative uh, and perhaps better placed to steamroller their plans uh, with, with their negotiations in, in Brussels? I think that it is a, a sign of a government that is very much on the back foot. Um, but actually, just... And it, it makes me think of the domestic um, politics. So... What's been exposed in, in recent um, weeks, and actually particularly around the tragedy of Grenfell, it's kind of, it's very raw and it's brought to the fore a, a lot of anger and hostility towards the, the concept of austerity. So, um, you know, uh, you don't have to be a kind of far left radical Corbyn Easter to be looking at the way you know, the state, services, sure start centres, their children's um, children's centres, um, you know, older people's care. People get 15 minute appointments from people coming to visit them in their homes and then they're back out the door. You know, the, the, there has been such a stripping away over so many years 
of, of, of what the state is providing and is prepared to provide. And, and people are, people have actually just had enough of it. And now they're saying, we want you to make a different choice. The problem for the Tories is that it's deeply ingrained in their own philosophy that the state shouldn't do more, the state should retreat. So actually what's happening now is, you know, I'm not, I'm not surprised at all that the Tory party and that Theresa May are, are coming across incredibly um, sheepish and, you know, uh, almost kind of, I mean, they, they virtually hid away in, 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 as did the Tory council in Kensington and Chelsea after, after the tragedy of Grenfell. I think they, they just can't find the answers within their own philosophical makeup. And, and this is a real problem for them. Um, there is a big backlash and, and, you know, I feel and I think a lot of people in, in the Labour Party and out in the country feel we need to draw a line under that direction of travel. People want to see, you know, people not having 15 minute appointments from a, 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 an overworked, underpaid care worker anymore. We want people to have time to look after people. We want the, the Sure Start centres back open. You know, we want local authorities to be properly funded again. Um, that wasn't even mentioned, as far as I'm aware, in the Queen's speech today. There's about, a, I think, a £4 billion budget deficit for local authorities next year, not mentioned. You know, the fact is these are massive issues um, and, and, and the Tories just don't have the answers. So it looks like, you know, people are going to genuinely turn to, to Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party to, to say, right, see, let's see what you can do. Mm. Yeah, and as you say, a, a whole lot of issues there got people extremely angry, especially in recent weeks. And what's interesting about the issues you raise is none of them are, are particularly new. And I just want to ask uh, Rory Broomfield. Uh, Rory, why do you think it is that during the last uh, 12 months or so, there's been this massive reversal of fortunes? Because uh, not so long ago, people were saying uh, Jeremy Corbyn was unelectable and that he would have to be replaced. Mm. Uh, and when it comes down to it and there's an election, he does much better than anyone expected. What do you attribute that reversal of fortunes to, Rory? Well, firstly, put it in context, uh, the Conservative Party did gain the most seats in the new parliament. They uh, increased their vote. They had a vote share akin to Tony Blair in 1997, when he uh, had a landslide in 97. Um, but in context, as you say, uh, the rise of Jeremy Corbyn in this sense uh, is uh, unexpected by many. And I think it's to do with what the Conservatives did rather than what the Labour Party did on the basis that the Conservatives, CCHQ and the Manifesto, sorry, the CCHQ is the campaign arm of the Conservative Party and the Manifesto just got it wrong. And they didn't portray and they didn't project the principle of ambition and aspiration that I think many people around the country actually want. And certainly young people want to be given hope and an understanding that their future can be better and the opportunities for them to grow and to uh, gain things that they don't yet have in their life, whether it be uh, material wealth or whether it be with family or what have you, housing, what have you, is open to them. And I don't believe the Conservative Party in their manifesto projected that principle of aspiration. They didn't even talk about the opportunities that the economy has created. And indeed, as a result, a lot of young people fled to Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. Uh, let me cross back now to Ryan in Brussels. Uh, Ryan, of course, the Europeans must be looking at what's happening there in the United Kingdom with alarm and possibly some relief in a way that they've got a much stronger uh, negotiating position, haven't they? Well, what do you think the mood is and what do you think the, the take is on all of these quite unexpected developments across the channel? I think it's much more a case of alarm. They don't want a weak and divided United Kingdom. They want somebody that they can trust to deliver on what they will talk about on the other side of the table. You know, there is a little element where people feel like Theresa May got a bit of what she deserved because they're upset that the UK decided to leave the EU, but they, they don't really want an unstable government because that is going to hurt 3 million EU citizens who are not from the UK but are living in the UK. It affects economic interests as well. So they would much rather have a stable situation. But Theresa May isn't really doing a lot to create that stable situation. She wants contradictory things. She said that she would go out and build more of a consensus around Brexit. But there isn't a consensus around a hard Brexit. So if she wants consensus, she can't have hard Brexit, for example. If she wants to control the borders, 
then she can't stay in the single market because that requires to have the freedom of movement across all of those borders. Also, if you want to control the borders, then you have to have a border. So you can't have that invisible border just for Ireland. There's a lot of contradictions here, and I don't see many of the ingredients for Theresa May to, to build up that consensus for this huge constitutional change that she's committed the UK to. Now, it doesn't mean I think we're not going to have a Brexit, but what it does mean is that you've got people in Brussels who are basically going to negotiate in good faith, but ultimately very sceptical that this is going to sort itself out neatly. And we're headed towards some kind of transitional arrangement, I would say. And, and maybe that transitional arrangement just sticks around for a very long time. But the idea that you're going to neatly land all of these complicated negotiations within the two-year time limit, it's a very optimistic thought indeed. Mike, let me turn to you at the University of Warwick, uh, just to read you an excerpt from the Queen's speech, which of course was written uh, for her by uh, the government. Uh, My government's priority is to secure the best possible deal as the country leaves uh, the European Union, so said uh, the Queen. But is is there is it really possible now for the UK to secure a, a, a good deal? Is there still a good deal to be had in your opinion? Well, I think, in a sense, the election result hasn't really changed much in in that regard. I defer to Ryan in terms of how it's being interpreted in Europe itself. But within the UK, we've had this ambiguity now over what Brexit would exactly look like, for getting on for a year. And the government, as late as last week, hadn't prepared position papers on a number of issues and looked a little bit lethargic in terms of its preparations for the negotiations. Now, understandably, that was partly due to the election, but also the election was called by the government itself. So... I'm not really sure that the chances of a good deal have diminished significantly in the last few weeks in the sense that I'm not really sure what kind of deal Britain has ever really wanted from this. The rhetoric around hard Brexit may always have been cosmetic. It may always have been a position in rhetoric. But at the same time, we are no further forwards in terms of the minutiae of what this is actually going to look like. In terms of whether Britain can get a good deal, again, it's an issue, you know, I echo this point about consensus. It's an issue about what Britain can build a consensus for at home. Um, is there a consensus for hard Brexit? No. But equally, there are aspects of a soft Brexit that will be unappealing to many British voters, uh, many of the British electorate. And that echoes itself in the Labour Party's position, which was very ambiguous. So it may not just be Theresa May that faces challenges going forwards. Jeremy Corbyn is riding high at the moment. Moment. But at the same time, his own party's position on Brexit is going to be tested in the next few months as amendments are put forward by other parties in the Commons around freedom of movement. And so I'm not really sure what anyone within the UK setup would see as a consensus good deal. And that's a problem that's been exacerbated perhaps by the election, but it certainly didn't start with it. Let me go back to you, uh, Nora. Nora Mulready from the Labour Party. Uh, just listening uh, to what Mike was just saying there, and, and just in the context of, of Europe, because of course that took up, uh, and the Brexit took up most of the Queen's nine minute long speech. Do you think that a, a smooth and orderly Brexit now looks more or less likely based on what you heard today and what we've uh, seen in the last couple of days? No, oh, I think it's. I mean, as as unlikely as ever it was, um, you know, like the the last person who spoke said, there there's there is it's going to be impossible to find a, a a consensus in this country. And one of the big problems that I think we have uh, politically here, and actually in a lot of a lot of different countries, is this idea of consent. You know, the the do the do the governed does the government have the consent of the governed to do what they're doing? Um, and in relation to Brexit. I mean, yes, they they won by by a small margin um, uh, of of the vote, but it's very difficult to see how we will be able to 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 offer anything to the or how people will be able to offer anything to the country that will get a consensus of support. I mean, the referendum should probably never have been held. It's put us in an absolutely terrible position. What I would suggest is, and what a lot of people have suggested now to Theresa May, is to try and make the best of this. She should try and bring in, you know, a a lot more voices into the discussion. Um, You know, she keeps everything so close, so tight. She doesn't tell anyone anything. She doesn't sort of trust people to, to, to bring them in. You know, why not have, you know, the Labour Party, the Lib Dems, you know, whoever, like, Bring bring people in, bring together a... This is a massive thing that we're doing uh, for our country. This is historic. If it happens, this is historic. I mean, let's have a, a kind of historic coalition cabinet on Brexit. You know, the idea that this would all be done by Theresa May and the DUP is is 
really bizarre um, and probably just not going to be palatable in the end to, to, to people, the people of this country. I think it's a... I can't see how it's not a disaster. So whatever happens, I can't see how it, it, politically it's not a disaster. OK, um, uh, Rory, Rory yeah. Broomfield from the uh, Better Off Out campaign shaking his head uh, through quite a lot of what you're just saying. Let's, let's, let's listen to how, how, you, how you respond to that, Rory. Well, the concept of if Brexit happens, I mean, this is ridiculous. Uh, we had a referendum where 17.4 million people voted to leave, which was the largest democratic mandate we've ever had in this country. Then the House of Commons voted to enact Article 50, and it, that was invoked later on this year. And just, just in the past couple of weeks, we've had a general election where over 80% of the members of Parliament that were elected were elected to leave the EU single market. So if we have a Brexit, is quite uh, academic nonsense. Um, the other side of it is that it can't see how it can't be a disaster. It, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is quite pessimistic talk. The opt today in the Queen's speech, what we saw is a, a whole range of plans, whether it be to do with trade or fishing or agriculture and a whole range of other things which the government wants to put forward and indeed to elicit the uh, consensus of Parliament in passing legislation, in freeing up a whole range of areas in UK industry that we haven't had control over for over a generation. So the opportunity is there to rebuild Britain in a way that's hugely positive to the population at large. Uh, Mike, let me ask you, Mike, at the University of Warwick, do, do you share that sentiment or do you think that there is perhaps a, a degree of regret, even in the ranks of people who did vote Brexit, saying that, you know, it's, uh, you know, open the bottle and the toothpaste, well, to, to mix my metaphors up entirely, the toothpaste is out of the tube and perhaps it would be better if uh, the lid had never been taken off the toothpaste tube in the first place. What do you, what do you say to that? I'm sure there are some voters who regret voting for Brexit, but equally there are probably some voters who regret voting for Remain. I think one thing that is absolutely the case is that there is, um, there is Brexit fatigue amongst the electorate. And I think there was some evidence of that being the case during the election campaign itself. Now, whilst the parties, whilst the, um, the Conservatives made great play of Brexit, whilst the Labour Party tried to have this studiously ambiguous position, it, didn't, it wasn't essentially a Brexit election, despite the fact that it was called on those terms. So I think one of the issues around the Brexit process going forwards is really what level and what ways the, the public are engaged with it. And essentially the debate between Nora and Rory, to some degree, is a debate about representative versus direct democracy. And what we have here is a real collision between those things. And then all the rest of us sitting back and trying to interpret what that means. And the reality is, I don't think anyone could say for you for certain whether or not there is a huge regrexit, whether or not there is a, you know, a huge relieve was one of the phrases that was used on the election campaign. I think what is the case, though, is as the material impacts start to be felt, that will condition responses. We have seen some sentiments move, particularly in some of the polling data sets in the last few weeks, as you start to see things like inflation bite home. As you start to see prices rise and real wages remain stagnant, the longer that process continues, then you may start to see some regrets. But I think the whole picture at the moment is so up in the air that it's very difficult to get a clear sense of what the British public thinks other than it's divided. Uh, and just briefly uh, to you, uh, uh, Ryan, in the, uh, Euro in, in the Politico Europe, who's joining us from Brussels. I mean, just looking at how events have panned out in the UK and the uncertainty that Brexit has 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 unleashed it in the country. Do you think that other countries in the European Union that thought perhaps following suit and, and perhaps leaving the European Union was a good idea are now perhaps thinking uh, that, that, that after all it, it isn't such a good idea, i.e. this is not a good advertisement or a good case study for leaving the EU? It's a mixed picture. I think when you see a big country like the UK mishandle some elements of the process, it is a warning shot to say, whoa, maybe my smaller country doesn't want to follow there. But we're seeing really mixed messages in some of the polling. So at once, the support levels for the EU are higher than they have been in quite a while. People are returning to that comfort zone, that comfort blanket of EU membership. But they quite like the idea of having a say on things that go to the heart of their identity. So you have a lot of people who'd like the referendum, but then they, in that referendum, they would vote to stay. So I think uh, we're going to see some mixed messages and a continuing debate there. And we might move more in the direction of national leaders saying it's too dangerous to have this debate. And that opens all its own questions about can people be trusted uh, with decisions like this? And that they're really fundamental questions. So you're not going to 
to put that genie back in the bottle. It's going to be one that continues for a while yet. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for that. You've had the last say. Thank you to all my uh, guests today, Labour Party member and political commentator Nora Mulready, uh, author and pundit Rory Broomfield, Mike Finn uh, at the University of Warwick, and there from Brussels, Ryan Heath, correspondent for Politico Europe. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. That was today's edition of The Debate. Time now for Media Watch. I'm joined by James Creedon. Hi there, Hi, Tom. Uh, we've just been talking there to some of our guests. Should they or should they not have read anything into the Queen's choice of outfit for the uh, state opening of Parliament? What are you hearing? Well, on Twitter, there's all sorts of speculation going on, uh, Tom, as you would imagine. Uh, just to take a look at one, uh, uh, I suppose, a, a, a politician, uh, Guy Verhofstadt, he's saying clearly the EU still inspires some in the UK. So he wasn't uh, waiting uh, to sort of, uh, uh, he, he wasn't taking very long to come to some conclusions. You can see others here uh, juxtaposing uh, a somewhat less stylish uh, baseball cap with the EU uh, emblem there and uh, the Queen's hat next to it. There, there is some similarity, it has to be said, a few fewer stars and uh, not quite as clearly a circular form, but there's, there's definitely kind of an echo, I suppose, of uh, the EU flag. Uh, Queen Elizabeth expresses her own view on Brexit while reading speech, a speech written by Theresa May. So I, that does point the bind that she was in, reading a speech which is trying to implement Brexit, but in her outfit perhaps sending a, a, a different message. So certainly there was a lot of intrigue about that. Did the Queen intentionally wear an EU-themed flag or was she magnificently trolled by her stylist? Something tells me she might have figured it out if she had been trolled by her uh, stylist. Now, this is a, 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 another line of comment that has come along. Last year, there was some speculation behind the scenes that she might have some favour for the Brexit plan. There was that front page of The Sun, which later uh, uh, they had to sort of stand down from because it was purely speculative. Uh, but some journalists claiming that, uh, that uh, there were noises that she was in favour of it. And here you have Twitter users saying, well, The Sun, I think not. In other words, this is a, a disavowal of that. Uh, others saying perhaps it might have been a bit more appropriate if she'd worn uh, that particular hat. But I think that might have been a bit... Uh, over the top. Mm, even <laughs> you or I would have a <laughs> tough job pulling that one off, I think. It's little OTT. Not perfect for Parliament, right. is it? Thank you so much for that, James Creedon, with that abridged version of a Media Watch. Thank you so much. That's it from me. News at the top of the hour. Don't go away.